talk about the deference of dependence. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. It's coming right now. So essentially, that falls into what is called energy yield. Okay. So uh, energy yield is interesting. So now all the non-ideality is essentially uh, when you put it in the field, is captured in here. So it's a measure of the deviation from standard test conditions, right? I take a 20% cell from Selexel, I take a 20% cell from SunPower, I put them both in the field, lo and behold, they perform totally differently. So if you had just captured the efficiency, you wouldn't know what your LCOE would be, right? So that non-ideality is what's captured in energy yield. It has several components. For example, number one component is that illumination level and incidence angle is not normal in the field, always, right? And you test it under normal conditions. Uh, the second is the temperature is different than room temperature, which is how you test it, 25C. Third, you know, you got dirt, you got bird poop, you can't stop bird pooping, you know. So essentially, shaded by leaf, all these other things going on, right? So how does the module essentially perform under those practical conditions? And then there is some downstream power losses in the system, which is cabling, inverter, all these system efficiencies. Okay, so remember, this is energy yield and its units are effective hours per day that the illumination corresponds to standard conditions, okay? And then you can actually, if you just remember that, so number ranges from three to six hours in a 24-hour period, and uh, the, the dependence arises from location, okay? Latitude, longitude, angle, you know. Uh, bird poop, this is the pre-efficiency part. The system's efficiency is downstream, and the module, what does it do under high temperature conditions is the question that you asked. Okay, so let's cover each one of these in a second. The number one, non your location, right? So, depends on location, time of the year, tilt. Here is Los Angeles uh, insulation, okay? Uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall. You can see that it ranges from four to six and a half hours a day. Pretty small. Okay, the average may be about five. So what I did was I took a chart and I plotted on Earth major subcontinents, major cities, and what's the annual average insulation? Because this is what it boils down to. So uh, U.S., Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. Okay, so in U.S. you can compare different ci cities here. Uh, New York is pretty low compared to Las Vegas, as you expect. But you can see, not more than still six hours. In Europe, it's pretty much all depressed, except for Barcelona, which is actually a great place to go anyway. Right? I don't know if you guys have been there. Uh, but the London, Paris, Munich, all is pretty depressed. Surprisingly, uh, you know, the largest world market of solar is in Germany, by far. And yet, the amount of sun that they get, you can see where it stands on the scale. So this is pretty dramatic, right? Uh, you can say uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia is pretty high. In India, there is a couple of places, Rajasthan and Bombay, very high, right? And then uh, uh, places like Dakar in Africa uh, are very high because of deserts, right? So, so this actually gives you some relative uh, insulation numbers. But the key is that instead of 24 hours a day, which is what we assume for that rule of thumb, now you're getting somewhere between three to six and a half hours a day, depending on your location. And that already represents 12 and a half to 27%, if you're three versus six and a half, of the 24 hour piece, right? So you can see the energy yield has already dropped to that amount, depending on your location. That's this component. Then the next component is the module. Okay, so let me just, that's that particular component. So what happens to a panel uh, under high temperature and under low light performance, right? This goes back to the question. Uh, there's two things. One is that when you heat the module up, depending on the ambient temperature, what is the temperature of the module? Okay, so if I put it in a, you know, uh, in 80 Fahrenheit, uh, not all modules would be the same temperature. It depends on their ability to dispense heat, right? So that's what's called nominal, it's a, the measure of that is nominal operating cell temperature, NOCT. Cooler it is, the better it is. And then the second part is, for every degree rise uh, temperature in the module, what is the hit in the efficiency, right? Which is also different depending on different technologies. So you can have panels which are starting with same efficiency, 
under st standard test conditions, but if they have better temperature coefficient efficiency, you'd rather buy those, right? And I'll, I'll show exactly what it depends on. Actually, let me not put a suspense. It depends on VOC, right? And the open circuit voltage of the solar panel. So higher the open circuit voltage, and, uh, and, and uh, maybe that's a good homework problem. I think it's a really good homework problem. It actually, uh, you take that uh, band gap temperature dependence, you differentiate it, set it to zero, and you'll see that actually dependence, uh, dependence of uh, VOC and temperature, essentially. Okay. And it actually is, depends on the difference between the band gap and VOC, right? So higher the VOC, lower the band gap, and the difference being smaller, lower the temperature coefficient efficiency, which is good. OK, so uh, the second part is low light performance, right? So not only do you get less normalized light, but your efficiency normalized with respect to that light also drops, right? So it's a double whammy. And that's what's shown in here, that you actually, as you go down on the level of irradiance, your efficiency is dropping, which is on top of your actual irradiance dropping. And uh, these different curves are 50C, 0C. So this is a temperature dependence. This is a light dependence, right? the typical module. So depending on what your level of uh, incoming light is and what temperature it is at, you can have between 80% to 100% efficiency. It represents a 75 to 100% of the STC max. That is multiplied by your location dependence originally, which is already 12 and a half to 27. Brings down the energy yield further. OK? Oh, I'm not going to talk about the other two times. So, but basically, I don't know how to quantify bird poop, so I'm going to leave that aside. But essentially, the system part is about 97% of the efficiency, right? So you can see the major hits in location. Location is really important. Then followed by the module, the type of module you buy. And then finally, the systems level, uh, which is pretty much 97% efficiency. So, uh, so it's not just a big differentiator. Okay. Now, Let's focus on this chart. I'm going to just populate this. This is actually the key, key chart, right? So if we understand all the concepts that we just explained, we should be able to read this chart uh, nicely. OK, so I want you to just focus on, oops, oh, maybe not. You know what? I'm going to go out of this mode and just show it in here, because I want to see all the plots. OK, so if you actually look at this chart, forget the bubbles and the blues and all that for a second. Just look at the curves, OK? The curve is the LCOE of solar as a function of insulation, location, OK? For different dollar per watt metric. You remember, if you go back to the LCOE formula, I, I ignored the maintenance cost, and it was dependent on dollar per watt and the uh, energy yield. Well, energy yield is captured in insulation, and dollar per watt is for different curves. So if you're cheaper, this curve to this curve, your LCOE is lower. You can see it's going down to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And if you have larger insulation, you're cheaper. OK, now you understand those curves. By the way, Solexo is here, the green curve, obviously. right? So we are, and I'll talk about why we were there in a second. But now you go back and populate that, this map with the bubbles. The size of the bubble is the market size for solar. right? And the location is the amount of insulation that they get. For example, US gets a large amount of insulation. By the way, this axis is in a different unit. It's per year as, per, as opposed to per day. So I, I put that back in because we, you know, we are more familiar with that, 1.36 to 5.2 hours a day. Um, and here you can see that if your solar curve is below your normal electricity cost, which is represented in those blue, then you have achieved grid parity. Okay, This is the concept you guys might have heard about many, many times. But uh, uh, so if installed capacity today in Germany is $1.50 a watt, which is here, Germany is already under grid parity. Solar is much cheaper than conventional, right? So there are several factors which go into determining the grid, grid parity. Hawaii, uh, 35 cents a kilowatt hour, an enormous amount of sun. It's a no-brainer, right? That Hawaii is not here, but it'll fit somewhere here. Right? Any of these curves would do. Any of the costs would do. So, so essentially, this is a really key thing to understand. Um, and this is why solar's future is really, really bright, no pun intended. But basically, there was a chart from McKinsey uh, in, a, in a recent report. And uh, this is another way of putting this. Essentially, you can see the dot, the, the, the orange curve, is solar. And the blue is conventional electricity in uh, LCOE. 
right? So you can see uh, that in many of the market segments, which are the different uh, rows in there, uh, the orange dot is to the left of the blue, which means it's already achieved parity in these market segments. And by the way, those green dots are select zone. OK? All right, so I come to the last chart uh, for LCOE, and then I'll switch to more interesting things. But basically, uh, repeating that uh, formula over there, if the cost was $1.25, I think if you were to pay attention to one slide in my whole talk, this would be the slide. OK? Because it probably may come in handy when you start a company. The, uh, if you take $1.25 per watt uh, for installed costs, remember that breakdown we had? 20% is wafer, 12% is cell, 16% is module, 52% is balance of system in that. So how do you weigh relative uh, innovation, right? The impact of re relative impact of innovation. So if you can come up with an idea which increases the efficiency by 1% absolute, go from 20% to 21%, it's so powerful compared to any of these things, right? Because it's equivalent in terms of LCOE impact to coming up with an idea where you, get, you have to reduce the cost of wafer by 25%, you have to reduce the cost of cell by 42%. So you know, think of the innovation you have to do to reduce the cost of cell process by half that's nearly equal to 1% efficiency increase. That's why it's so powerful. And similarly, energy yield is pretty powerful too. And the balance of system is pretty powerful. So on this chart, if you can innovate around balance of system, energy yield, and efficiency, you're in really good shape. Now, three years ago, it was different, right? These ratios were different. OK, so that, that's what the central message is that you have to look at the levers. They're changing with time uh, in terms of innovation's impact on the bottom line of energy, which is LCOE. Okay.